Okay, welcome everybody to the next edition of my debate that I'm practicing for. This is part two. These are the second arguments that I'm going to be making in my case against the necessity of welfare. Let's begin. I'm going to be looking at another government social welfare intervention with the intent to support parents with children in child care. And this program is failing to deliver on the goals that it has set for itself. It is failing by trying to do good with someone else's money. The issue is, is with child care subsidies. And I applaud the government for making efforts to streamline the system. Recently, they moved from a two-tiered system to a single system, a single means-tested system. So that will reduce costs, so I think that's a positive thing. But as we are seeing with many other programs, the desire to do a good thing leads to an unfavorable outcome, once again for low income and the most vulnerable people. We hear the rhetoric from government cons describing such programs as the, quote, child care safety net, and I've already described how I feel about this, this analogy of the safety net. So I won't go into it any further. So let's, let's talk about the purpose of child care. Going back to the 1970s, governments su subsidized nonprofit child care services primarily to poor people. As we see with the trend of welfare, eventually the, su the subsidies balloon extending to every family with the twofold mission to increase female workforce participation and to improve outcomes for early childhood development. It might be a noble aim, but it appears to be having the opposite effect as I'll outline later. If you earn up to $65,000, you can get 85% subsidy. If you earn up to $250,000, you can get a 50% subsidy. For those earning $350,000, they get a subsidy of 20%. How these subsidies can be given to such high-income earners is beyond me. If welfare is for the sake of the poor and of the less fortunate, we are paying a lot of money to people who can afford it far more easily than those in the lowest tax bracket. It distorts the child care market, and the better off win, and the worse off lose. Another problem with the government subsidy is it is capped. At whatever hourly cost per child in daycare that isn't covered, parents will have to pay it themselves. It is possible for the wealthy to do this with ease, but not so easy for lower-income people to do. So what has this government involvement done to the market? The Financial Review says there's a boom in the child care industry. I quote from the article, Private equity firms, investment banks, and wholesale fund managers are all buying into the sector, acquiring large portfolios or investing in operators. Close quote. The average price for a child care center has gone up from under half a million dollars in 2010 to over $4 million in 2017. The Financial Review is quick to note some of the potential pitfalls, which is oversupply. A headline from the ABC says this, Child care centers saturated, small business at risk, say industry group. In this article, you hear the sad story of a mom-and-pop child care center that are unable to compete with the bigger players with more cash. The big centers can survive, the small ones are more at risk. If you thought that more players in the market for childcare meant lower prices to consumers, you would be wrong. What has been found is the opposite. Childcare centers have had to increase prices to cover lower enrollment, but the other side is stated by groups in the industry. Quote, Ms. Lawson said guaranteed income from government subsidies meant childcare had become a solid investment opportunity. Close quote. Now, what market do you know of that has a guaranteed income? Only a market where the government is meddling. In another report, it highlights how lower-income people are affected. Quote, According to the ACA, child care fees are rising at an exponential rate but aren't being adequately offset by government rebates, which forces parents to pull their children out of child care or to work less. As I said earlier, it is having the opposite effect in some cases less female workforce part force participation, and higher costs. While families are able to, to apply for a federal government child care subsidy that can see them pay reduced fees, this is capped in, at an hourly rate of eleven seventy seven per hour, and many child care center, center fees across Sydney far exceed this cap, leaving parents saddled with the excess costs. Part of the problem is the government tries to reduce costs through subsidies, yet heavily regulates the industry, which will inevitably lead to higher costs to deliver services. It's a schizophrenic way of operating that only the government can get away with. If we are subsidizing childcare to ensure more women are in the workforce, this government welfare program is failing to achieve that goal. 
Another report describes the government's own findings on the cost of health care rising. Child care fees increases continue to outpace the cost of living, with poor families spending a higher proportion of their pay compared with those better off. New government data shows, close quote. Now, the total cost this report gives is $9 billion by the taxpayer going to child care fees. Labor's fact check on the claim that child care has gone up by 28% was deemed to be, quote, in the ballpark. Another report showed a cost increase of 65% between 2011 and 2017. Welfare, whether it be in the form of New Start or the single parent subsidy, is a burden the taxpayer cannot afford. The government shows a pattern, a pattern of inability to deliver on the promises it proposes. It promises to alleviate poverty through welfare, but only succeeds in perpetuating it and trapping the most vulnerable in its net. It fails to achieve the desired goal to bring more women into the workforce by running a welfare program for childcare. Why do we continue on this welfare road that continues to fail to achieve what it says it can? I believe it is due to a lack of alternatives. It is due to the difficulty of making change when it is in. Look at the scaremongering Labor did in the last two elections, declaring that the welfare relating to Medicare had to be, quote, saved from the Liberals. When welfare is in, it is hard to get out of it. But there are altern alternatives for consideration. We could abolish the welfare system as we know it and introduce a, a negative income tax. We would streamline delivery, cut costs associated with one group being paid to tell another group how to spend their money, we would treat people more equally by applying the same standards to them as we do to working people. We could eliminate government involvement in child care and reduce costs and see more female participation in the workforce. We would incentivize people enough so that they could gradually improve in their position. Each and every one of you, free from the burden of funding failed programs by the government, losing money to welfare fraudsters, losing money to jailing them, would in theory be taxed less. You would have more money in your pocket to spend where you want to. You could spend it on private charity if you so desire. I attempted to prove my theory that as the welfare states grow, charitable spending decreases, and I failed to find any evidence that welfare states, nations with strong welfare systems are any less charitable or that charity reduces in these places. Quite the opposite. Charitable spending does not go down in welfare states. That tells me that even when people are being forced by government to support others, their charity does not end there. They continue to willingly give to those in need. We already see this with the GoFundMe phenomenon. One third of all GoFundMe campaigns go towards medical bills. It goes towards people in need, in times of desperation. These GoFundMe campaigns are voluntary, they are targeted, and people pay what they can afford rather than having their wages taken from them and being told how much they are going to pay. This is just one example of what is possible. When individuals are empowered to make decisions on their own, and I suspect we would see much more charitable giving than we do, were it not for the bureaucrats and politicians that think they can spend your money better than you can. I would urge you tonight, today, wherever you are, to reconsider your support for the necessity of the welfare state, and to consider what is possible by free-thinking people in the world, and how we can better fulfill the moral obligation that we have to support the poor, to support those in need.